Hello, everybody. I am Gila Safrana, a specialist in prostodontology and oral rehabilitation from the University of Tel Aviv, and founder of the Prosto unit in Bellinson Hospital. Uh, I have my own practice, which is a multidisciplinary approach with uh, many other colleagues of mine in other disciplines. Um, currently, I'm the secretary and next president of the Israeli Society of Prostodontics and also active in other uh, other societies and um, we can start the lecture now okay my friends we'll start the lecture now we're talking about the transgingival component as i said it's a prostodontic key to success in implant-based rehabilitation now why is it so when we ask doctors what are the goals for implant prostodontics, you get a lot of answers. But three, three answers, I think, will, will be the most common. First, they want long-term success. The second one is aesthetics, and the third one is the ability to immediately load. If you think about long-term success and aesthetics, they are mostly influenced by the soft tissue being healthy around the neck of the implant and at the base of our prosthesis. And uh, that's basically the transgingival component that is influencing the most on that uh, subject. The lecture uh, will be divided into three. I'll start talking about segmental imp implant restoration. That's just part of the jaw to be restored. And single tooth implant restorations, which sometimes hold the challenge of aesthetics in a higher level and full arch implant supported restoration rehabilitation in which in, in each of them I'll talk about different types of transgingival components and what are the cons and pros for each of them. I'll start with segmental implant restoration as I said and um, I hope uh, you get something to your clinic that you can uh, use. So first case is a simple case um, of a 65 years old person that came to my clinic. It was in 2011. Um, he had an intact upper jaw and missing molars in the lower jaw. So we started planning a 3D plan of placing the implants, uh, taking into account the uh, alveolar nerve. This is the plan. And we created a full fully guided um, surgical guide so uh, we can do a flapless procedure and do the preparation and placement of the implant through this guide. The idea was to, to do as minimally invasive as possible since the patient was not very healthy and was uh, quite afraid of dental treatment. That's why he postponed it for so long. So we placed the implants through the guide and immediately placed a multi-unit abutment. Notice that the multi-units are concave in form. That actually lets the soft tissue lie in this concavity very nicely and in a quite a high thickness. And what you see in the pictures is the placement of the transgingival component, in this case a multi-unit, at the day of implantation. At this day, the thickness of the tissue is actually the final thickness of the tissue. We haven't manipulated it, it's not swollen yet, so that's the thickness. In most cases, there will be no um, radical change. And since it's a posterior case, even if, we, if the, the metal shows just a bit, it will not hurt the case. So we placed the multi-units and took an immediate impression. Notice that in the planning process, we planned on the right side a submerged implants, subcrestal implants, and on the left side they were just to the crestal level. In order to see the influence of placing those multi-units and, uh, and final uh, restoration and see what happens in uh, several years, the idea was to put the multi-units and, and not to remove them anymore. We took impressions, in this case it was normal impressions that were scanned to digital, we planned the final prosthesis. The first was like a pair of PMMA 
screw retained uh, crowns, bridges actually, they were connected on both sides and uh, you can see on the left they were a bit more uh, light colored since it was PMMA color A3 and three months later basically I did not take any new impressions just ordered the technician to create the final prosthesis which is full zirconia screw retained to the implants on both sides they are connected and this is how it looks so this is on the day of uh, uh, three months after implantation the final restoration nine years later we can see that almost no bone is lost around the implants the bone is a bit disengaged from the multi-unit on the left side the sub a crystal placement of implants but uh, generally the health is perfect the the gums are uh, healthy and everything is in place for quite a long time um, I would say that the uh, anatomy of the implant at the neck which is platform shifting uh, and then you have the concavity creates a thickness of soft tissue which is quite higher than in normal cases where you have uh, a convex or a wide abutments that creates a greater health at the neck of the implant a second case uh, before the second case I would like to talk about transchangeable component types we just saw the multi unit which is basically for a screw retained uh, uh, restoration there is the classic abutment which, uh, which we use for cement retained restorations and there's direct to implant restorations that are screw retained like using tie base or um, the whole thing is completely manufactured by the lab and uh, connected directly to the uh, implants I will show cases of all types so uh, we can uh, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each I will tell you that today in the digital age and I will talk about digital in the next lecture the screw retained is um, actually easier to do so um, you would choose more screw retained another case this was an, a lady 88 years old had some problems with her teeth uh, you could see that the teeth on the left upper side marked by X were uh, hopeless for several different reasons and um, there, there were some more problems that will be uh, engaged later so in this specific uh, case we decided that we'll extract these three teeth place the implants do everything guided as, as guided as possible in order to m do it um, minimally invasive as possible so you can see here we did the uh, uh, setup of the teeth everything is in virtual created uh, the implant position the optimal implant position and uh, accordingly created the guide the guide is a full guide which means we do all the preparations through the guide place the implants through the guide and on the right side you can see the implants placed I can tell you that the implants were placed placed very uh, parallel to each other due to this guide without the guide being full I would probably place just two implants which is enough and argu arguably enough in this case so this is how it looks we take an impression a digital impression at the implant level and uh, send it to the lab the lab starts planning basically the three teeth that we uh, uh, chose in the beginning and again in this case we're using T-base that will be connected to the zirconia crowns in the lab so it's a screw retained to implant level the T base is connected to the zirconia so there is no cementation in the mouth I'm sure all of you know the downside of cementation to implants um, that is done uh, orally so this is the final bridge you can see as it is placed the tissue looks very healthy we did not hurt the papilla or the pseudo papilla between the implants and uh, the case was um, actually pretty easy for the for the patient and for the doctor 
I believe that keeping it simple really helps, especially in prostodontics, especially in uh, more sensitive patients. This is how it looks in the x-ray. Um, notice that basically we used Tybis in this case. We used a multi-unis with concave in this, in this case. I would like to note that uh, Paltup, uh, of which I'm an advisor, um, has concave in all its uh, implant parts, including even the transfers, which I will show, the T-base, the impression coping, the, the impression uh, mechanism for um, digital dentistry, which is called uh, flags in USA and uh, abutments in uh, Europe. <coughs> Let's go for the third case, another segmental case. This patient was 56 years old. He had a bridge from the premolar to the second molar, uh, which was a four unit bridge. The premolar was um, diagnosed as hopeless due to a uh, severe loss of uh, attachment to the roots and was planned for extraction. This is the CT as it was seen in 2D. And we planned actually a very simple case for this. We'll place implants at 15, 16, because we have enough uh, space from the base, from the floor of the sinus. And we'll place an implant, an immediate implant at the extraction side of 14. And the question is, what will be the temporization? Will it be removable? Will it be a tooth supported, maybe from the canine to the, to the second molar? Or will, be, will it be an implant supported case? So we planned a, th a four unit bridge which relies on the uh, second molar and has like a rest on the canine. This will actually also point us to where is the uh, optimal position of the implant neck. It's not the full guide, just the neck of the implant. This is an old case, today I would probably do it with a guide, maybe a full guide. So we remove the uh, an old bridge, we see tooth number 17, which we prepare a little, and we extract um, the two um, um, <coughs> roots of uh, tooth number 14, I'm talking in Europe numbers, which is the first uh, premolar. Then we use the seg bridge, which is a semi-guide, to point the necks of the implant, raise a small flap, and we see a nice ridge. We start with the preparation for the implants, first osteotomy. We can see we are almost engaged to the floor of the sinus at the molar site, which is 10 millimeters. And on this pre the second premolar, we have 11.5. And the first premolar, we quite, we quite have a lot of length. Uh, we check the placement according to our pre-prepared -pre -pre bridge provisional, and then we place the implants at a torque that reached about 55 Newton centimeter. Um, in the first premolar area, we noticed that there's a big uh, buckle gap around uh, tooth number 14, although it was, it had quite a uh, high stability to start with. These were the implants that were placed. <coughs> so I did a uh, some autogenous bone and some um, xenograft and covered the, the first premolar and connected peak temporary abutments to the uh, second premolar and the first molar implants. I connect the temporary bridge to the PMMA bridge to the uh, peak abutments with composite. First I use uh, uh, some kind of uh, bonding, then I connect it. That's, in my, in my hands, the easiest way to do it. I remove the, in the bridge, and now I'm going to create the, the neck, the transgingival component. I'm going to create um, a concave uh, area around the uh, neck of the implants connecting to the bridge, so the tissue can heal as comfortably as possible. On the healing phase of the soft tissue, you do not want to create pressure. 
On the contrary, we would like to make as much space for the soft tissue to heal so you can handle it much better on the next phase, which is the final prosthesis, if needs be. So we do some preparations. It's a screw retained. Today, today I believe I would load the, uh, the first molar as well. And um, I screw retain it and cement it to the molar as well. Only in the uh, provisional phase, I connect teeth and implants to get as much stability as possible. In, uh, final, in the final stage, I would uh, rather not connect teeth and implant. It's a whole new, it's a whole different subject of whether or not to connect, but usually you do not wish to connect it. And I place two sutures, um, vertical mattress, just to exactly the papillas, just to create something which is a, a pseudo papilla. You cannot create a real papilla around uh, between two implants, but you can create something that looks like a papilla. Let it heal for about three months. This is talking about peak and it, its advantages as a, as a biocompatible material and a very good material to be used in the provisional phase. And we look at the healing. This is how it looks. Pick is completely translucent. What you see here is actually the, uh, the composite that filled it. And this is the healing phase. And notice that there's like pseudo papillas. And now we can take the impressions. I chose this case because it's actually a case in which I used classical uh, dentistry. Today I use mainly digital. And um, the transfers that are used for the impressions are also concave. It's very important that they're concave because when you put your material between these transfers, it actually copies very nicely the, uh, the um, tissue, the soft tissue, and the way it, as it healed, and uh, you get the emergence profile that you have already created. We place late afterwards uh, three abutments and um, zirconia with veneering three implants are connected and the uh, second molar which is a tooth is not connected to that bridge as i said in the final i will not connect them uh, this is a resin guide which is actually the copy of the skeleton of the zirconia skeleton with holes that uh, allows me to place the abutments as precisely as possible and this is how the final work uh, looks. In this case, I place the implants a crystal, even a bit supra crystal. And um, I would like to say that I've learned that placing implants subcrystal is good for the uh, maxilla, whereas in the mandible, I would rather place the implants in the crystal level and. Uh, I'll show it in the uh, last segment of, of the lecture when talking about full arch and why does it make more sense. So this is the final work. And this is how it looks uh, going back a bit. After a few years, you can see you have a little recession. And the reason for that, that we didn't have enough concave part. If we place the implants a bit deeper, cho chosen instead of 13 at 11.5 and put the implants uh, one millimeter deeper into the bone and had the ability to use concave and even screw it and concave parts, I believe would have less uh, bone loss around the implant. Still, uh, all the threads are covered by bone and we have just in the, at the neck of the implants and it's pretty stable. Another case, this is a, another old lady that came around, had some very hard extractions as, as you could see, and had a lot of uh, um, systemic problems, and we needed to uh, have a minimally invasive procedure, as less in invasive as possible due to her conditions. So we started planning, we planned at first a four tooth, a, four teeth uh, from lateral to first uh, to second premolar. Accordingly, we planned the implants, um, a tilted implant um, 
okay, just adjacent to the sinus, to the anterior sinus floor or wall, and two straight implants at the lateral and canine. So we placed the implants through the guide, and this is after the healing process, and we came to take the impressions. During the... Um, <coughs> the uh, sorry, that's the, placing the implants and creating the uh, PMMA uh, provisional, which was connected to the implants. And after the implants were uh, fully integrated, we take digital impressions and start planning the uh, final prosthesis. The provision on this case looked a bit bulky, so we decided to choose smaller teeth, uh, as you can see. So uh, we used actually five teeth uh, to uh, rehabilitate those three implants. This is the impressions. It's a digital impression. And in this case, we planned to create the whole skeleton including the transgingival component that will be connected directly to the implants um, at the lab. So this would be milled and we'll get this uh, uh, metal-based skeleton that will be veneered afterwards and screw retained to the implants. This is how when we checked it, we took uh, bite registration and then it was veneered and screw retained to the implants. Um, when you come to do a metal framework, in, in, in some of the cases, we do the metal framework without, the, we don't use T bases and we connect it directly to the implants. There is a downside about it because in most cases you have um, different metal types. It's not titanium. Uh, and if you're Having two uh, different metal types, you might have some problems due to um, metal uh, ions uh, moving from one to the other and creating some, some um, discomfort to the soft tissue. Uh, today, when we create a metal framework, we do, uh, we do use titanium, which makes the uh, veneering a bit more difficult, but it is possible in several different types. So this is after the porcelain veneered and everything is the mouth. And again, this, the case was pretty simple and the patient was uh, happy. Moving to single implant. As I said before, the single implant usually are in the anterior area poses a challenge in the aesthetic level. Let's look at this case. We have a broken central. This was a young lady in her early uh, 30s or late 20s. The tooth was broken. We had to extract it and do something immediate, so uh, we took immediately an impression and created um, a PMMA. The plan was to do a PMMA. The extraction was used was uh, uh, using a Benex extraction, which actually creates a pulling force, thus leaving all the soft tissue intact, especially the papillas. My friends, if you lose the papilla, in the front area, it's really hard to reconstruct it. And I'm a prosthodontist, and I do not know how to, uh, to recreate a papilla. I will have to use a periodontist or another specialist to help me with that. So I try to conserve the papilla. We place the implant, and even before I continue to the provisional, I place a concave healing abutment. That really protects the implant and allows me to fulfill the buccal gap, since we placed the implant more palatally, in a very easy way. As you can see, I can um, push the uh, grains of bone into the buccal gap very easily, and the concavity of the, of the healing abutment allows me to push it very easily into that area. That is how the implant looks, and the temporary... Um, and this is basically the temporary attached like a Maryland to both to uh, both adjacent teeth. In this case, I decided not to load the implants since I had a very buckle, a very uh, big buckle gap, and uh, any lateral force would might uh, cause a micro motion of the of the implant or more than micro, and we would lose the implant. So we place the implants without loading, and this is the temporary. The idea is 
we left the healing abutment with the concave uh, uh, anatomy to create as much thick soft tissue as possible. It is very easy to handle an excess of soft tissue. It is very hard to reconstruct lost tissue. And we got to that. Now, how did I get to this situation uh, after, uh, after the integration and uh, uh, management of the soft tissue? I will show you. I took an impression after the uh, implant was uh, integrated and asked the technician, please create me a temporary screwy tan crown that matches, matches in form the exact facet of uh, a 21, which is the left central incisor, and the rest should be concave. All the rest should be concave. Now, when I place that temporary crown in the mouth, you could see it's really making a lot of pressure on the tissue. Why? Because we had excess tissue. I remove some of the excess tissue from the inside of the um, of the uh, um, soft tissue of the uh, around the implant. I put I first put a cover screw on the implant to protect it without touching the the implant itself. So we're we are actually working on the emergence uh, profile from the inner uh, aspect, and we continue and replace the uh, temporary. And then we start planning the final prosthesis. The final prosthesis will be basically a T-base connected with the zirconia, which will be, will be the, uh, the abutment uh, the, of the, uh, the core of the uh, crown. And Emax will be pressed into this abutment. So now I can place this abutment, which is not final yet, and on top of it, what you see on the right picture is actually um, the wax up that will be pressed as Emax. I can check it in the mouth and to see the incisor line and the buccal anatomy. If I like them, all the technician has to do is match the color, finish it off, and the rest of the transgingival component will be concave as usual, as usual. Here you can see the facet and the concavity at the buccal area. And after a while, the, tissue, the soft tissue will look exactly like that. And this is the final prosthesis, before on the left, after placement on the right, we can see that we have really nice papillas and the soft tissue looks very healthy. Several years later, you can see that we lost some, some of the papilla, and is, it is expected because um, you do lose papillas, uh, papilla height around implants. But the patient was very happy, and five years post-op, if this is the uh, situation, we are, as dentists, happy as well. Another case. This patient had uh, laminates quite a while ago and uh, came crying, like this, the previous patient, that her lateral is broken. The tooth itself had a short root with uh, quite a lot of bone around it. And again, we asked ourselves, we had to do an extraction, what will be the immediate phase? So, in the lateral, as opposed to the central, we can do an immediate, which will be pretty much covered by bone, because the root of the lateral is short and we can place a much longer implant. This is the crown, and you can see the crown and actually the root as well that came off. About three to four millimeters of root was broken and came off from the buccal area. So again, we do a minimally a traumatic extraction, not hurting the papillas, and we stop the preparation and place our implant a bit more uh, palatally and put immediately 
a multi-unit. But since in this case, it's a single crown, I'm using a single unit, which is basically a multi-unit with a hex at the top, which will allow me to place a, an anti-rotatory uh, sleeve. So we place the, uh, mo the single unit, again it's concave to preserve as much thickness of the soft tissue as possible and promote more soft tissue to, to be created uh, at the neck of the implant, above the neck of the implant. This is the single unit. The implant was uh, 4.2 and it has a platform shifting to 3.5 then the concaveness of the single unit on top of it uh, a, a sleeve will be attached actually you can even use a tie, tie based sleeve which is smaller and uh, easier to uh, manipulate when you need so we place the implant we place the multi unit and uh, provisionally actually in this case was using her laminate and uh, some of the um, crown and root itself. So I started removing the inside of the, of the crown that we removed from her tooth and uh, fitted it to the titanium sleeve, then used all the connection materials that I, I could in order to connect the um, uh, laminate and part of the tooth to the titanium sleeve, removed it, and now we had to work out of the mouth in order to complete all the uh, modifications and uh, enhance the, atta the attachment to, uh, between the crown and the sleeve. Bonding, polishing, making sure everything is as smooth as possible, and replacing it in the mouth. And this is how it looks at the day of, of the procedure. Ten days post-op, she was... Uh, told not to brush the area too much, to be uh, as careful as possible. So the, you can see that the soft tissue is a bit swollen. One month later it looks much better. At this stage we could do several things, either do a new crown uh, three months later or redo the whole veneering and the new crown. But the patient asked me a very easy asked me a question, can I not stay with that crown? And I said, well, the materials are actually all uh, final materials. It's composite, it's the laminate, and it's the um, uh, titanium sleeve. And all of them are super ginger ones, so none will hurt the soft tissue. In the soft tissue area, the trans gingival component is a concave multi-unit, it will hold. So actually, for many years, that's the way she's going around, and she's smiling, and she's pretty happy. Okay, I'm moving actually to a full uh, arch. We'll start with a case that's almost full arch. In this case, we, I, I, I did a staged approach. That means I'm leaving some of the teeth, which are actually pretty hopeless, or in a or uh, in a poor condition and are not meant uh, plans to uh, be left in the mouth, placing implants in between them, and uh, the provisional phase was actually on the teeth. The provisional phase copied her previous uh, teeth, and um, we kept the vertical dimension, and uh, the patient was quite happy with the, with the provisional. So what I want to show you is how I'm moving from the provisional to the final stage. Basically, we scan the upper provisional, we scan, we scan the lower jaw, and we scan the relation between the jaws. Now, the minute we scan the relations of the provisional upper jaw to the, to the existing lower jaw, the uh, the relation between the maxilla and mandibula digitally is set. So now when I delete the provisional, it's still aligned to each other perfectly as it was with the provisional. So the next thing I have to do is just take an impression
I'm taking the impression of the uh, impression posts or or digital flags. And now, as you can see on the right side, we have uh, the upper jaw with the uh, posts related to lo the lower jaw exactly as they were related with the provisional. I do not need to take another uh, alignment between the jaws. This really makes life much easier. So now, what do I tell my technician? I told him, I tell him, you see the provisional, right? Which is tooth supported. Now I want a second provisional in which you extract the teeth, uh, create a screw retained provisional. In the extraction site, I want an ovid pontic because they will then help uh, promoting a pseudo papilla and uh, the healing site. And I will place it in the mouth immediately. So this is the provisional. And again, wherever the implants are more submerged, we use a concave tie base where, where they're like more crystal or uh, to the gingiva level, we use a zero uh, height uh, tie base. You have basically all the heights you need um, with this company, Palto. So this is the, provision, the provisional, which is screw retained to the implants. Now all I had to do is extract these teeth and place the provisional. And this is how it looks at the day of extraction and immediate provisionalization. And this is how the patient left. She was extremely afraid of the extractions and they went very smoothly. And this is how she looked at the uh, second provisional phase, which is, which is an implant supported. And uh, basically after everything is healed, we just have to copy it in the final phase. So let's now talk about full arch. This patient was in his 50s. He had uh, he was challenged, he's challenged mentally, and it was quite uh, hard to treat him. A doctor that was um, helping him in his uh, um, hospital tried to create a uh, removable. He could not use it. He was crying all the time, and we had to give him some kind of solution. So we decided that with his uh, mandible, we can actually place six implants and do uh, some kind of screw retained uh, as a unremovable fixed prosthesis that will help him and promote the case. So we started planning. We planned digitally six implants. Again, we planned it in 3D. We left the uh, tooth, the second molar, as support. And... Um, Basically, it's one tooth and a tissue-supported uh, surgical guide, which is not an extremely precise guide, but um, so you have to take it into account when planning the implants. But you can you can use the ridge and the um, because it's a, a full arch, so the arch itself gives us some stability and the tooth to uh, plan the implants. So we plant the, impl the implants, place them quite easily, immediately a concave concave abutments. And this is how it looks. Then I took digital impressions. By the way, the um, tooth, the second molar, was actually holding the vertical dimension. That's uh, another uh, reason not to remove it in the beginning. So it helped us keep the vertical dimension. We took an impression. And since this was like a pro bono case, and I told my, uh, my technician about it, instead of creating a PMMA, uh, as a solution for this patient because um, we wanted to keep costs as low as possible and give him something that is comfortable. Uh, my technician actually created a full zirconia bridge and uh, this is how it looks. The patient was extremely happy and uh, of course all his supporting family was uh, very very happy as well. We placed it in the mouth. This is how it looks. We made sure he could clean with a water pick underneath the bridge. And uh, again, look at the concave part of the multi-unit. It really promotes uh, soft tissue health and creates a much uh, thicker tissue that basically um, promotes health for the implants and the higher longevity. As you can see, it's screw retained. Uh, we 
could not yet uh, extract the second molar because that you know, that was the plan. And this is after I closed it with uh, actually um, a Fuji 9, which in my opinion is a really easy material to use to close the access to the screw, screw holes. This is the occlusion. Another case, an old lady came over, she had some problems in the upper uh, upper jaw, but the main problem for her was that she could not uh, use the denture. Even though the denture was lying on four implants, the implants were not perfect. But seeing that she had four implants, planning just two more implants, we can create some kind of uh, screw it and provisional. Now to create a screw retained and now to keep uh, the costs of this screw retained provision low, we uh, opted for a material called graphene nano, which is like like full zirconia. Basically, it's a monolithic material. It's not very cheap, it, but the costs are less than half, and it's very comfortable and it's very easy to use. You don't even need uh, tie bases. But you do need multi-units. That means you have to take the impression from the multi-unit level. So we placed two implants. We took uh, an impression at the level of the multi-units. Her denture were, was uh, adjusted to uh, sit on these multi-units. That's why you can see the uh, hexes are cl the uh, screw uh, screws are uh, closed with a soft material, actually Teflon. We take the impression. This is the impression. Taking the alignment between the jaws is another issue. By the way, I use the same uh, impression, uh, digital impression copings for the uh, inter-arch registration. If some of them are interfering, I remove them and then get to the correct vertical dimension and then scan the inter-arch uh, occlusion. I will speak about that in the digital uh, lecture. So this is the impression, and the technician actually plans in 3D the full uh, uh, prosthesis, including the teeth and the connection to the, uh, the uh, multi-units, and this is how it, it would look. And basically he sends it to milling, he mills it, and uh, the minute we have the file we can always mill another set. That's a very, very comfortable and easy solution. So this is final, the final prosthesis. It was done by a, a lab called Kraus in Israel. As you can see, there's no tie base. It is directly screw retained to the multi-units. I use a corsodil gel, as you can see written in Hebrew, in the screws and inside the implants, and then I screw it all, screw it all to the implants, close it with the Teflon, and uh, after about a month, I recheck the retention and re-tighten um, the screws, and then close it again with Teflon gel corsodil, which is chlorhexidine, and uh, Fuji 9, which is basically glass ionomer, and this is the final prosthesis. As you can see, the graphene nano is radiolucent completely, unfortunately. I think that I hope they will fix, because then you can really see less of the uh, prosthesis. But you can see that the implants are intact. This, uh, actually, we saw already in the first picture, but it's pretty stable. So the last case I will be running through, it's a big case, which we'll talk about uh, again in the um, next lecture. This patient came with a pretty much hopeless dentition in both uh, jaws. So we had to plan, and I, I, I brought this case because I really want to talk about the difference between the upper jaw and the lower jaw in a prostodontic point of view. So both the jaws are pretty hopeless. We scan them, scan the upper jaw. This is the tissue scanning and a setup. You have to create a, some kind of a setup. Check it in the mouth and see that uh, teeth are in the correct position, especially phonetically. I always start with the phonetics. I check the incisor line both in the horizontal and vertical 
placement in order to create the perfect ph phonetics. The minute the phonetics is good, usually the aesthetics is also very well. And then we place implants. I'll go into details of how we choose, but notice that we chose canon on, canine on one side and not a canine on the other side in order to have implants as a, much integrated into his own bone as possible. And now we're actually shelling out virtually the uh, setup, then shelling out the soft tissue and see that our implants are mainly placed in the, his own, own bone. That means these implants can be uh, loaded. Now this is how the implants look uh, within the bone. You can also see where we got into the sinus and we need some uh, uh, sinus floor elevations. The lower jaw, we had uh, actually a much better integration of the implants into his own bone without the need of uh, um, this extreme bone augmentation. We would leave two teeth intact uh, um, in place for the retention of the surgical guide just for the surgical procedure. When we're done with the surgical procedure and placed all the implants, we will remove those teeth as well. So the plan was upper jaw, a guide supported by bone, lower jaw, a guide supported by teeth. Now you can see the setup matching quite precisely in, in to the uh, um, set of che te teeth chosen by the technician. Now these are the virtual teeth and the setup, the plant guide, lower teeth setup by the technician. It's a set of teeth which has much more details than a normal, than the setup itself, than the scan itself. And we create the guides. This is the lower guide, as you can see, it's supported by two teeth, and it's at the pilot level. Whereas the upper guide uh, is supported by bone, the front teeth will be a full guide, and the back teeth, in which the extraction site is pretty big due to uh, a lot of roots and um, some periodontal problems, will be only pilots, so we can manage them after the pilot phase and complete preparation and osteotomy for the implants. The idea is to lose as less bone as possible. Now, I would like to talk less about the surgical part and more about the prosthetic, prosthetic part. Now look at what I have chosen for the um, provisionals. The upper jaw, we prepared holes in which we can uh, do a screw retain. So the holes are pretty uh, big because you need at least a 2.8 or 3 millimeters diameter in order to uh, for the um, for the for the sleeves to go through the through your uh, provisional. Whereas in the lower jaw we did the minimal hole, which is actually just to see the place of the of the temporary abutment. Then we can we we know if we have to remove some of the mesial, uh, distal or maybe palato or lingual. And it's also a ventilation a hole from which the excess material will be removed easily. So the upper jaw, as I said, is uh, bone supported. We place it, we place the implants, and we do a we create a retention to the um, in this case peak a peak uh, sleeves that are screw retained to. Uh, multi-units. So the upper jaw is screw retained. The lower jaw is actually cement retained to temporary provisionals. Now why do I do that? In the upper jaw I ask the surgeon please place the implants a bit subcrestally. I need to be able to manipulate the soft tissue better in the lower in the upper jaw especially due to um, the challenge of aesthetics, if I have one. And um, the second reason, I always want to create a screw retained provisional in the upper jaw since the bone is much softer. Whereas in the lower jaw, especially in this case, the implants had a lot of bone, which was uh, D3 and had uh, very high stability. So doing a screw retained and um, cementation was um, less of a risk. 
Now, why do I do uh, uh, cement retained lower jaw? When I place the upper jaw and create a screw retained, I want the uh, temporary bridges to align to each other exactly as the lab uh, planned them. So I can um, do a cement retain, close the patient's mouth, put them in alignment, and let it cure in complete alignment. Whereas in cases where I did screwed against screwed, sometimes this alignment got uh, a bit off, then I really had to work on the uh, occlusion and pretty much miss the occlusion that the technician created so beautifully. So this is uh, how it looks after the surgery and the immediate placement of the provisionals. You can see the screw retained multi-units in the upper jaw. The surgeon is in this, in this case was Deborah schwartz -Arad. She loves working with uh, <coughs> a, a different type of implants in which the multi-units are thicker. The implants are actually very good, but in my opinion, the multi-units without concave cause more stress to the uh, uh, soft tissue, and I would choose a concave multi-unit multi -unit in this case. The lower jaw, we had uh, temporary healing abutments, which are conical, and uh, pretty easily we uh, match the, the um, lower jaw to the uh, temporary abutments. And this is how it looks. A healing period, we had a lot of uh, pink material, both in the upper jaw and the lower jaw. The lower jaw due to um, the height, basically the vertical dimension that we needed. And the, uh, in the upper jaw, it was more for aesthetic reason, but the, uh, we could see that uh, after the multi-units and uh, the upper jaw, the crowns were pretty close to the implant, to the um, multi-units. So in the final phase, we decided that in the upper jaw, for the sake of being of uh, be, ab be abling to clean it properly, will remove the uh, pink part. So we took an impression, basically from the uh, temporary that's already um, planned. We do the technician did a cutback, and this is a virtual cutback, which is much easier than doing a physical cutback that they used to do in the part. And this is the uh, STLs of the metal frame that should be should uh, be milled. The metal frame is milled and then veneered. And now the final is screw retained to the multi-units, as was the temporary. This is the provisional on the left side and the final on the right side. And you can see that they're almost identical. The only difference is removing the pink part. And in the <coughs> lower jaw, the provisional was cement retained to um, to the uh, temporary abutments, and now the final is the same uh, form anatomy of teeth, but screw retained directly to the implants. The whole framework was um, milled, including the attachment to the implant level. The the work opa, the work was done by Kraus Labs. And this is how it looks in the mouth. Lower jaw and upper jaw. And final prosthesis placed. And this is the x-ray of the final prosthesis. Okay, let's talk about the gingival component. First of all, you need to cho choose your treatment strategy for optimal tissue health. Not every case is uh, built for immediate loading and uh, promoting as much, as thick as possible um, soft tissue will really help you in the final stages. So you also need to choose the transgival component for both the provisional phase and the final phase. You can choose a screw retained in the provisional phase and do a cement retained in the final stage. But I would say that um, the most important thing is to keep the cement out of the transgingival area. So if you do a cemented part, it should really be a, a super gingival. And uh, having a screw retained provisional is by far better than a, a, a cement retained provisional. The final stage has a, 
has a different way of thinking because everything is already healed. So um, that will be your choice. But the thing is, really keep it simple. So if you have both phases the same type, it will be easier for you. And try to optimize the treatment and outco outcome by putting more into thinking and planning before the procedure and creating a procedure as short as possible, as healthy as possible, and as easy as possible to the patient. Thank you. My name is Gila Safrana, and this is my email, which is very easy, gilatasafrana.com. And you can uh, mail, uh, mail me later or ask me questions now in the, um, in the um, site that you're using now. Thank you. Okay, my friends, um, I see a few questions now, and uh, I'll start answering. How to decide a height and width of the abutment? Well, it was about in the first case. So basically, if you do a punch, the tissue uh, thickness is the actual th tissue thickness. So I choose the height according to that. In that case, we had different sides. On the right side, it was like about two to three millimeters, which is uh, usually the most common height I'm using for, uh, for the multi-units. And on the left side, it was deeper because we placed the implants uh, subcrestally. Uh, regarding width, you basically in multi-units you have one width. There is a possibility for a, a higher width, but um, I rarely use it. So um, you have normal one type of width in multi-units, which actually makes the prostodontic part uh, very, very easy. Um, even if you have different types of implants, in the end you have one platform for your prosthesis, and it makes it much easier. Um, a second question. One second, let's see. The second question is you use two hex abutments, why not non hexed? It was in the case of uh, two implants. There was two implants, they were parallel. If the implants are really parallel to each other without, without any angulation from between them. You can use a hex abutment. It's a bit more risky because it really has to sit very, uh, very well. I will do that only in um, a two implant case. I do believe that if you engage the hex as well, you'll get more uh, stability. But I would say that today more and more, I, I use more non-hexed. Um, uh, engagement for more than one implant. Um, sometimes in the provisional, I use the hex uh, peak abutments. And if I have an um, angulation problem, I, I touch the hex and, uh, and in, a, in order to get the ability to sit the provisional uh, better. Uh, another very good question. Temporary was screw retained and the fixed was cement retained. Why not screw retained as well? It's a good question. First of all, I would say that today, especially in the digital era, I would do a fix, uh, screw retained in both phases. It's much easier, it sits better. I believe it promotes better healing process if the, the prosthesis was done properly. But to answer the question, in, in the temporary phase, screw retained, especially in immediate loading, is extremely important because you need the stability for the healing process, for the integration process of the implants themselves. In the after integration, the final prosthesis, it really doesn't have a lot of difference if you did a uh, um, fixed cemented or fixed screw retained. It depends on the case, depends on your uh, um, on your experience. Sometimes uh, actually cement retained gets you better aesthetics. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the access holes are not in the uh, optimal position. So it's basically a choice that you have to do and uh, there is no need to do a temporary and a fixed in the same exact system. But temporary screw retained, I do believe it's uh, 
it's in most cases a necessity. But I showed you in the last case why I don't do uh, screw retained in the upper jaw, full upper jaw, and screw retained in the full lower jaw. In my experience, it makes the occlusion much harder. So I do a fixed upper jaw, and if I can, I do the um, alignment in occlusion between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So basically, I connect the uh, lower provisional to the temporary abutments in occlusion. And that makes life much easier because the occlusion is exactly as you planned it. And otherwise, you usually do have to touch it. And uh, one more question. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. I'll try to answer most of them. Um, <clears throat> how did you extract the lateral incisor out traumatically? The specific lateral incisor, as I said, was very short-rooted. Um, if it was a long-rooted, I would have removed the post and do the do a Benex extraction, but it was very uh, short, so I just used luxators. I think everyone should have some luxators in his uh, a set of luxators in his clinic, and try to very gently start moving the the tooth. You have to understand that you don't need to do a very severe one motion. You have to do uh, a lot of small motions. The PDL slowly tears exactly by by the way as the Benex. You don't do one pull, you just do it slowly, the PDL tears down and the tooth and the root comes out uh, very easily. The most important, really, don't tear the papilla. Are there any complications on upper joint plants that perforated the sinus? The sinus was lifted, it was done by Dr. Schwert Sarad, which is uh, one of the best surgeons and there were no complications. Um, I, I don't. I, there was no implant exposed into the sinus um, cavity. So even if uh, it looked like that in the uh, X-ray, it wasn't exposed. Um, someone asked me which scanner am I using? Well, I had experience with quite a lot of scanners, and uh, lately I'm using the Trio uh, scanner. And uh, I must say that I'm very happy with it and I can finally uh, scan full jaws and be very secure that I will receive a very uh, nice fitting uh, provisional and even final. But you have to understand that scanning um, has a learning curve, exactly like normal impressions. Normal impressions have a very long learning curve. And you have to understand the way the scanner works. You have first to scan the whole arch in a fewer number of frames in order for the, uh, for the arch to be stitched properly. And then you have to give the details. That's another lecture, but um, definitely the Trios is uh, one of the fine scanners and it's very um, ad adept at prosthodontics. There are a few more companies and um, I would um, promote it. I would like suggest to try it. How's your opinion about the use of UCLA abutment? I don't use UCLA anymore. Um, even if you do decide to uh, do an abutment which is um, customized and uh, not UCLA, I scan and I get the customized ab abutment which is completely milled by the lab and immediately another provision that will sit on it. So in cases where that's, that would be a case in which I choose to do a cement retained. Usually it happens when the implants are very buckly oriented, aligned and uh, we place um, customized abutments and uh, provisional. And then I scan the uh, customized abutments in order to receive the final bridge. So you need basically two scans, one scan for the abutments and one scan for the, um, for the, uh, of the abutments for the uh, final, pro final uh, prosthesis. Uh, another very interesting case which I, in, in which I use uh, as the abutment are in the anterior area. If you have like a, two centrals, which actually happens quite a lot. One central is a tooth that has been prepared and the other is an implant. I want the technician to create 
um, a customized abutment that imitates the tooth. So it looks as if I have two prepared teeth. So you scan it, you receive the customized abutment, which is usually a tie base with zirconia attached to it, and you screw it exactly like a full crown, but in this case, it's a prepared tooth. And then you scan both of them and receive two crowns that look looks perfect. Actually, I've done just now a job with the uh, with the Elon uh, Elon uh, Bosch, and it came out beautifully. I might show it in another uh, presentation. Okay, did you think? I did not understand. Under zirconia, positioning 4.64, 4.7 is not too hard material on implants. Ah, very, okay. Dr. Simon Cohen asked me a question, which is very, very, very good one. We placed a full zirconia on six implants in the lower jaw in one of the last cases. If you ask my opinion about zirconia, I think it's a material that will pass away. It's definitely a hard material. It's too hard. And um, you can see what, for instance, with the graphene which is a permanent uh, material, or supposed to be permanent, the patients feel more, more comfortable. You sit it more uh, co comfortably into the mouth. So I do believe that a synthetic material will come up that has uh, lesser hardness and uh, less tendency to break. Zirconia is completely unelastic. And when it breaks, it breaks completely and you really have to redo the whole job again. So today, most cases, uh, when we're doing a full arch, we actually use titanium skeleton and we either cement onto it the crowns and but leave the access to the screws hole holes uh, in the crowns in order to access the hole the screws or uh, do veneering uh, as i said titanium is a harder material to veneer than uh, for instance non-precious but it's a better solution for several reasons first it's titanium to titanium engagement if it's direct to the implant second of all it's much lighter you really feel the the difference in uh, in weight and uh, titanium does not break when you um, stress it like zirconia. It doesn't have uh, time degradation. In, a, in my opinion, zirconia will pass away. For now, it's one of the best of the good materials. We know we need to know how to use it. Usually when I'll go for zirconia, I will segment it like anterior and two posteriors and not do full zirconia. That's from experience. Thank you, everybody. I hope it was interesting and uh, may all this corona pass away and we'll go back to our clinics and work.